The past is where you learn the lesson. The future is where you apply the lesson. Today, it's lessons from 2018. Welcome to Grass-Fed Life. I'm your host, Diego. Today, Darby and I are opening up registration for the brand new, the very exclusive, in-person Farm Business Essentials Scaling Your Farm Business Mastermind Workshop. It's a small group focused in-person workshop held at Primal Pastures here in Southern California. Everyone who signs up for the workshop will get the two-day in-person workshop and they'll also get instant and permanent access to the online Farm Business Essentials course. And as a special bonus, the first 10 people who sign up for the workshop get the Pastured Poultry Processing course included for free. It's an exclusive event. There's only 30 tickets for sale. When they're gone, they're gone. Register, and if you're one of the first 10 people, get your free course included. Sign up at grassfedlife.co. With that, let's jump right into today's episode. It's lessons from 2018, so you can have a better 2019. So as we start to close out 2018 and move into 2019, this time of year is a time of year where a lot of people do reflection and they start looking ahead. Today, you and I are going to focus on the reflection part, looking back at the year that was 2018. And I think this is going to be a different episode than you and I have ever done before because we're going to try and blend some different things that we learned from life, be it farming or business related or otherwise, into this show. We're each going to bring five to the table and then we'll discuss those. So if you're listening to this, think about what we've brought to the table here and then think about some lessons that you've learned this year and maybe how you can apply them in 2019. So to kick it off, I'll go first with you, Darby. What's one of the big takeaways or things that you learned from 2018? Personally, um, I have to say it's you have to be able to identify when it's time to say no to something. Um, And and for me, I've I've had to learn to say no to a lot of things because I I like to say yes to everything. I seem to think that there's a uh, um, just this indefinite amount of time and energy because uh, I, I am a, a high energy person. Um, so I, I, generally speaking, I've got to do a better job at learning to say no, but specifically I've had to learn when it's time to say no to something that's both successful and profitable. It's a tough lesson, I think, for a lot of people to learn. I mean, I struggle with that still, and I've struggled with it over the years on a business standpoint because new opportunity is always exciting. And I'm with you. I feel like I can always take on more, add more. And then the danger, and this, I don't want to get too far ahead, ties into one of the things I had is you say yes to that thing and you realize, oh my God, what did I say yes to? And look at how much work it's actually taking. You know, for you, you've mentioned this in past episodes that we've recorded. It's really not necessarily a money thing. It's more like a time and physical exertion, physical energy thing is a premium. I mean, have you paid by just saying yes to too much from a mental and physical side? More, I think from a physical side, definitely than mental. I mean, there's, there's definitely a mental component to it. Um, but for me personally, uh, yeah, my, my body, um, has it's it's got more mileage i think than most 44 year olds <laughs> so um with with my my low back and for for me specifically this is you know looking forward at at what we're going to do with pastured poultry in in 2019 and i really felt like i wanted to scale that back further in 2018 and then you know we didn't we we committed to keep going brought someone in hoped to hand that off to them that didn't pan out um so it took a physical toll on me it's taken a physical toll on my wife and even even though it's highly successful and highly profitable uh we're we're taking a one-year hiatus in 2019 with poultry we're 
we're taking a year off so that we can recuperate physically more than mentally mentally definitely but yeah it's more physical so going forward knowing this i mean say it comes to bringing pastured poultry back after the year of rest 2019 how do you decide at that point knowing what you've learned now whether you bring it back for the right reasons or you just kind of give in to that we've always done it we should do it it's not going to be that hard versus you know really really thinking about this and saying you know does this make sense yeah i think in in the past that decision like like th- this overall decision's been looming for a year or two um, specifically since May of 17, when I had a very significant injury, um, and we've, we've, we've kept it going precisely because of what you just said. We've always done it. Um, and, and we, we needed, we needed the income. Um, and, and frankly, the, you know, the income would, would still be really nice to have, um, particularly from a, from a cash flow standpoint in the spring and summer. Um, but if, you know, if, and when we bring it back post 2019, it, it, like the, the finances will be very secondary. Like it will have to fit into life for us to bring it back. Yeah. And I think the one unique thing about what you've learned here is it's shutting down something, saying no to something that is working, at least from a business standpoint. It's not like that enterprise was floundering or flailing and you were hoping it would turn one day it's like one more spin of the slot machine and we'll hit it this was working it was paying and i know just from past experience on my end when you put a lot of work into something when you build something it can be hard to walk away from it just from a this is my baby thing versus when you should be walking away. Right, exactly. That's the um that's the emotional tie that that we all have. And uh <clears throat> I I think if, if I were to hire a third party to come in here and and analyze all this, they they'd probably look at it and say, "Well, yeah, it's it's working wonderfully on the financial end." You know, we're we're, we're doing batches of birds you know, 550 to 600. And we're consistently showing five figure profits. Um, we had a batch. Um, I, I haven't gone through the numbers this fall, uh, but it, it, it was our, our birds averaged bigger than a batch we did in the fall of 17. And that, that batch in the fall of 17, we, we cleared over $11,000 on, on that one batch of chickens. So this most recent one, it was probably closer to 12. Not now, not every batch is that successful. Um, so again, on the financial side, yeah, it's, you know, (laughs) the, uh, the thing is fired on all cylinders, um, very, very well, but from a physical standpoint, I just like, I've got to take a break. You know, um, my wife now needs a break. She, she's been doing this with me for two years and that was never the intention. Um, so she, she's ready for a break and you, you've got to again, step back and and try to view this through a non-biased third party lens and say, okay, well, like, Yeah, it's working. Yeah, it's hard to make this decision. Yes, it's bringing a lot of money into the farm. But, you know, for reasons outside of that, it's it's just time to take a take one year off just just from this one enterprise. Like we're you know, <laughs> we're not going to quit doing uh pork and beef. I mean, those are going to keep humming right along. But poultry, we're taking a break. One thing I always like to think about when it comes time to the, should I get rid of it? Should I keep it? And we used to talk about this in finance. If you had a stock that wasn't performing, you'd always ask, well, would you buy this today knowing what you know now? And if you look at pastured poultry, let's assume you were just doing pork, you were just doing cattle. 
knowing the state of your life as it is today, would you start doing pastured poultry given your context in 2019 if you weren't doing it now? Uh, giving, given my personal context, no, no. Um, it's something that you can do as you get older. Um, but I think, you know, there, there are, uh, things on the veg side that are much the same way, right? Um, like you don't want to be hunched over, uh, cutting salad greens four hours a day when you're, you're 55 years old. And I, I'll say the same thing about pastured poultry. Like you, you can do a whole bunch of it when you're younger, but as you start to get older, I think you, you've got to do less of it, it, um, or, or maybe not do it at all, you know? So, um, I think if we, you know, again, if we, if we were to bring it back, we, we'd bring it back as a, as a much smaller niche part of our overall strategy. Like we might just do one big batch and call it good. That might be, it might be a one time a year thing, you know, kind of like the, the turkeys have been for Thanksgiving. We might just do that with chicken if, if we would bring it back at all. Um, yeah, I, but I wouldn't start it today at given my age, physical stature and everything else that I know. When you look back at the end of next year after having dropped it, I mean, how do you evaluate that was a good move? Is it, I feel rested, I feel recovered, you know, we did okay financially without having this as part of the mix? Uh, do you look at the side of like, you know, I just miss it? How are you going to reflect on this down the line and in, in try and distill down if it was if it's the right long-term decision versus truly a hiatus? Yeah, I think for me, it's going to be physical. Um, I think for my wife, it's going to be more mental. And uh, I think, you know, for both of us, we'll, we'll look at the, the financial impact. Um, you know, there, there are lots of other ways to, to bring income in to, to live on. So, Again, for us, that's that's pretty, you know, low priority. So, um, but I, I know for her, it's more it's more mental. Yeah, she's physically tired, but it's you know, if I'm eighty percent physical and twenty percent mental, you know, she's she's flip flopped, right? She's eighty percent mental and twenty percent physical. So I think we'll both have a different view on it. Um, do we miss it? Yeah, I'm sure we're gonna miss it. Um, and it's not like we're not going to do poultry next year. Like I'm, we're going to raise our own for sure. Uh, we'll run a couple of our new chicken tractor designs. You know, we're, we're going to raise our own stuff. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to go buy chicken from somebody else. Um, you know, so I, I guess we're still, or at least me personally, like I'm going to get that fix if you will. Um, and probably through that continue to, to tweak my system on a, a much smaller scale, just a more efficient and really kind of push the envelope on how we're managing the birds, our target weights, feed conversion, things of that nature. Um, so it's not like that's going to go away. And I think from a, an emotional standpoint, that's like that's going to fill my emotional gas tank, if you will. When you think about pastured poultry being, you know, one part of what you do, you're doing a lot of different things between everything that we do, everything that you do on the farm. There's not a lot of bandwidth to add new things into the mix. And some people get a lot of excitement and motivation from starting stuff, doing new things. And that can be good and it can also be a curse because at some point you know you just got to do something well and excel at it did you at any point like just in farming feel like hey you know i've, I've limited some of what i can do in life because i am so tied to the farm and i don't mean just business from a business standpoint but even from like hobbies or some things like that that you wanted to pursue or for you in your personality type did you find that it just worked? I got something, it's succeeding, I can do this, I'm content. So is it the 
Is it that or was there a true lack of being able to have the freedom in the space to try new stuff? Honestly, both. So <clears throat> I think most people like they're they're fine with it forever or they flame out fast because of how tied you are to the farm when you do something like poultry. Um, I was okay with it for a very long time. It's only been in the past year and a half that um, as my kids have gotten older, it's really started to wear on me because you, you start realizing, and I've talked about this before, like your, your time with your, your kids is limited. And our window with our kids is really closing fast. So, um, it started, it started to wear on me being tied to the farm so much, particularly in the summer, because we can't go do anything. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about this too, like great American ballpark in Cincinnati is less than two hours door to door. And for us to go to a baseball game, on a Sunday in the summer, like that takes a lot of strategic planning. If you've got poultry on the farm, it, you're just, you're just tied to it. it unless you've, you know, scheduled someone to, to come over and check on stuff. So it took me a lot longer to get there than most people, but I did eventually get to the point of, yeah, this is, this is kind of getting old from just being tied down so often. Yeah. And I'm, I'm somewhat in that same boat. You know, where I've now arrived on a mix of business stuff that works, it pays the bills, and that has closed off a lot of new opportunity. And some of that might just be frivolous opportunity where, like, I, I would enjoy saying, yeah, let's do this. And then I'd step back later and say, oh, God, why did I make this decision? So it's that power of limiting your choices and limiting taking on new things but i've also you know struggled as an entrepreneur of limiting things that i have just wanted to do or maybe have done in the past like if i'm want a garden like that's just got totally backburnered put to the side it doesn't pay the bills it's low priority and i've had to say no to that and I think anybody who's working a full-time job now looking to start any sort of business on the side or transition over to full-time, like you're going to have to get really comfortable saying no, being honest with yourself, shutting down things when they don't work or shutting down things that work, but they're just not a fit. And that's not always easy to do. Yeah, it's really, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do. Um, and, and a lot of people will chide you for that. You know, well, aren't you making money? You know, uh, your business is healthy. Like, why would you stop? And it's just one of those things that and until they've walked a mile in your shoes, they'll never understand. Right. And I, and I you know, some of the stuff I say yes to or no to is related to growth. You know, there's possibly stuff I could do more with say paper pot that could expand it. And I'm like, I'm already working. I feel like too much. I need to set my own limits for how much I'm going to work and be okay with the trade off of, well, that might mean growth is going to come. I don't want to say slower, but differently, it's going to have a different pattern. And that can also be really hard. I think for entrepreneurs to say like, well, Maybe you're leaving money on the table because the entrepreneurial culture that gets glorified in the U.S. is like work 20 hours, grow as fast as you can, make a bunch of money. And that's one of the things that attracted me into this space of like it, you can make your own way, create your own destiny. But then on the flip side, when you start getting into that and you have – a life beside yourself. I've had to get really comfortable this year just being like, well, yeah, that's a nice to have. It's not necessarily a need to have. If I don't do it, it's not going to hurt, but it's also not going to help. I'm okay with that because I would rather just 
spend some time doing other things today or relaxing a little bit. I don't want to wake up at 60 realizing like, look what I've built, but also, oh my God, look what I've missed. So I think this this whole principle of saying no to things, I don't think anybody's going to ever master that. And I think it's something that will forever apply to your life, my life, and anybody listening to this. Yeah. And, and it's a, uh, there's, I think a, a perpetual juggling act there. Like you, you've got to at the very least annually sit back, reflect on and make changes going forward. And that's like, that's not my personality as an engineer. Again, I've talked about this in the past. Like I just want to get the plates spinning and then just keep them spinning. like, okay, we've got it. We've built it. It works. Okay, now this is what we do. It's a routine. Um, yeah, but uh, with more and more experience as I get a little older, I've realized that's really not the best mode of operation. You've, you've got to be able to reflect and make changes so that everything fits with life, you know. And um, I, I was actually balancing this this whole idea of some good friends of mine that I've known for, oh boy, eight, nine years now. They're um, uh, full-time, functionally organic vegetable growers here in the greater Indianapolis area and was talking with them about it. And, um, um, you know, the, the wife said, yeah, but like this, it's got to fit with life. It's, it's got to fit with life. And if it doesn't fit with life, then, you know, maybe, maybe you got to step back. And I think that was for me. And that, that was a very recent conversation. Um, that was the proverbial, you know, final nail in the coffin, so to speak. And in checking in with the fit on life, if this is resonating with you, here's a process that I go through periodically, not just this time of year, but I'll sit back and look at everything that I'm doing on a typical week. Most of that stuff is static. And I and I try and say, okay, what am I doing here? And what is really adding value to the business, to my life? What can I get rid of? Am I doing too much of stuff that really isn't as important as I might think it is? Do I get into automaton mode of where you're just doing instead of thinking about, well, should I even be doing this in the first place? So just look at what you're doing and say, does this all make sense? Does it all play a role? And does it all integrate with the rest of my life? Are other people upset that I'm doing this thing? Is it, am I punishing somebody else in a way? Because I work on the business 20 hours a day and, you know, my wife has to now be a full-time mom, like a full-time single mom who's not single. Those types of thoughts, I, I think, are really valuable this time of year. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a great time of year to sit back and, and reflect on that and make a plan going forward, particularly for those of us in a, a four-season climate when we're not busy with the hustle and bustle of having as many livestock to care for and we can sit back and chew on this. The first lesson that I have ties a little bit into the idea of what you talked about there of, you know, your kids are getting older, your window's shutting. And this has been a really really hard pill for me to swallow. And it's starting to become a little bit of a pet peeve because if you go on Instagram now, a lot of farms, people love to show their kids on the farm, in the field, on a veg farm, you know, around the livestock, not just fun photos, but like their child is there while they are working. And it's starting to really make me mad because one of the lessons I've learned, and I think this is a truism, is entrepreneurialism and having your kids around you is a myth. You might want it, but it is a functional uh, non-starter. It's just not going to work. A surgeon doesn't bring his kids to work. A teacher doesn't bring their kids to work. 
uh, somebody at Starbucks doesn't have their kids there. And the reason they don't is because work time is work time and trying to parent, especially some of the kids you see in these photos who can't even walk and trying to be a parent and do work at the same time ain't going to happen. And I know so many people get sucked into this lifestyle, especially around farming, because they want to be around their kids and have their kids with them. And I've talked to enough parents now and a lot of moms who their kids go to daycare because they can't be a mom and a farmer at the same time. And I would agree. I can't be a business owner and a dad at the same time. I've tried to mesh them. I've tried to do work and have my kids in the same room. I end up getting angry and they end up probably getting frustrated thinking, why does dad work so much? I think you can balance them, but it requires segregating the day off. So that's how I want to kick off mine is my idea of entrepreneurship and having your kids around is a myth. What do you think? Could you have younger kids around you and do what you do every day? There, there's, there is some truth to what you said, particularly when your kids are younger. Now, my kids are older, so they are and have been for a, a few years physically able to help. Um, so it, it really it kind of it kind of depends on what your business is. Now, you're more um, y y you do a lot of desk work, you know, where you've, it's a lot of critical thinking and you're very engrossed. You know, when I'm now doing something physical, uh, moving chicken tractors or, you know, um, sorting pigs or rotating the cows, like those are tasks that our kids can be a part of and have been a part of for a long time. They, they can they can go help us. Um, so there's there's some truth there. But I think, yeah, when your kids are two years old four years old, six years old, that's pretty difficult. It really wasn't until our kids were like six, seven, eight years old that we could start to integrate them. Um, we've definitely integrated them since they were eight and 11 uh, doing the farmer's market every Saturday. So, you know, for us, that's that's been a way to do that. But it's not, there, there's truth there in that, like your kid's not going to be with you if you're working 45 or 50 hours a week as a farmer like I, I don't see, well, first of all, your kid can't work that many hours. Right. Um, the, and then, but depending on their, on their age, like maybe they can be with you for five to 10% of that, maybe up to, you know, with our kids, 20%. If you factor in the farmer's market, cause that's a, that's a eight, nine hour chunk. Um, but yeah, there's, there's, while there's, there's more myth there than there is reality, I think. Yeah, because the other tie-in I wanted to bring into this is also a lot of people who want to get into this space, I think inherently also kind of gravitate towards homeschool and they want to homeschool. And this is where I think you take that myth and you just blow it up some more. Because if you want to be a full-time entrepreneur and homeschool your kids at the same time, it's near impossible. And I say this from personal experience and I'm somebody who feels like I'm very organized. I can get stuff done. I don't have a problem getting distracted. The only way we've been successful doing it is I have to basically just massively chunk up my day. Like this is when I can do work. This is when I can't do work. And that means like the middle of my day, like I don't work on a business. And I think depending on what your business is, this probably wouldn't work for farming because I can get up at 4 a.m., work till 8 a.m. and get most of the stuff done. I don't know that you could do that. And then do homeschool and hang around with my kids in the middle of the day and then come back later on and say like, you know, work from 7 to 10 at night. And that works for me, but for trying to blend them, this kind of goes back to your point of saying no. If you're trying to do it all and chase this farming lifestyle, build a farm business, homeschool, and make it all happen at one time, uh, 
unless you have extra people around, a spouse, maybe some uh, in-laws, parents that can help, it's going to be really hard. Like I understand why school exists and it's so part of it is so adults can do work because you can't typically do most of your work with your kids around most of your work time. Yeah, it really, it really depends on how your business is structured for us because we, we do do that. Um, my wife homeschools our kids, but you don't homeschool your kids. I don't, I, 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 I help here and there, particularly with math. Right. Um, but it's very limited. So kind of our structure was like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm the full-time farmer. Uh, we're, we're both doing a farmer's market. So, you know, that's like my wife's Saturday. That's my Saturday. Um, I'll chip in with the homeschooling where it's required. And prior to May of 17, when I blew my back out, you know, Brandy and or the kids, like they would chip in with the farm stuff only when it was required. Right. So if we had to move the cattle herd, you know, a third of a mile, a half of a mile from the the back pasture to the front pasture, the way we're physically and logistically set up without giving any details, like that's at least a three person, usually a four person task. And it's going to take an hour and a half to two hours. We can schedule that in. Um, or little pigs, you know, okay, uh, I need, I need help for an hour loading pigs. Uh, Brandy would get the kids set up with, with school tasks. They're old enough. We could leave them in here for an hour. We've got our phones with us. If they need something, they call. She goes out with me for an hour. We load the pigs. She comes back in, goes back to being homeschool mom. So she was literally a pinch hitter coming off the bench occasionally when needed. Her primary role was, you know, teacher slash homemaker, you know, um, we've made a lot of decisions to live very simply financially to make all this possible, you know, so there's, there's the trade-off to make it, to make it work. You know, we're basically trying, the the farm has provided a little bit more than one full-time income because you really need more than one full-time income, at least full-time as defined by farm income, where we're at to, to live, you know, comfortably. Right. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we've made it work. But again, what works for me isn't going to work for somebody else. Yeah. Income's a huge thing because if you, if you can't get by on the primary or say the only the entrepreneurial income, then that effectively requires someone to get some sort of income. Maybe that's home-based Maybe that's leaving the home, but then if that second person has to start producing income, that's going to draw them away from having to do homeschool, childcare, if that's required, then that means you're going to have to shift what you do. And, and that's a struggle. I mean, that that's again what we're facing. And it's obviously very different given the age of your kids. I have seven, five, and two. And to try and teach a seven-year-old and have a two-year-old in the room occupied without a TV or a tablet in front of them, not easy. Like, it's a disservice in a way to the seven-year-old. So the, we have to divide and conquer when we do homeschool. And that, that just means there's two people involved because somebody kind of has to babysit and somebody has to teach. So not saying it's not possible, but... It's very challenging and it's not as sexy as those Instagram pictures want you to make it believe it is, the romanticism of it. And the best advice I can have is decide when you're going to do work, decide when you're going to be a husband or wife and a parent, and try your best to make sure that those time blocks are truly compartmentalized. And you're not letting business slip over into dad time or mom time because I think if you try and do at least the type of work I do, desk work, when a kid's around, I end up just getting mad. 
And if I can at least segregate it, they know their segregation. I know their segregation. I can do my work. They know not to bug me during that time. When I'm done, I come in. I'm not doing work. I'm into whatever we're doing. And that's been the biggest help for me. But it's much harder to execute this in reality than it sounds me talking about. This has been a long time coming. And by far, what I do is not perfect. But it is at least functional at this point where... People aren't getting upset. I'm not as mad. I'm not as stressed. And we've made it work. Yeah, I, I think compartmentalization is is the word I would I would choose to use there. Just know, like if your if your goal is to you know derive all your income from being an entrepreneur, and you also have young kids, and the other goal is to homeschool the kids, like you're both working full time. It's a lot. You know, you're not subbing out the education of your kids to a third party. So it uh, it's a lot of energy. It takes a lot of balance. It takes a lot of, you have to be very intentional or something's going to falter. Either your business is going to falter, your relationships are going to falter, or your kids are going to get the shaft on the quality of education that they're getting or, or not getting. Yeah. And they don't want stressed, mad, angry, non-engaged dad or mom either Uh, it's one thing to be around your kids you know just near them it's another thing to be around them and in the moment and i think sometimes business owners like you're so into what you're doing and, and you have a hard time shutting it off that when you do go do something with the kids you're still thinking about those other things so yeah really trying to compartmentalize time blocks that's helped and i've also found like the greatest thing i've ever done is compartmentalizing myself physically meaning i can go work in a space that has a door in my case two doors separating me from them and if they're homeschooling i'd almost suggest the same thing because if you got to run into the house in the middle of their homeschooling and they haven't seen you in a while if they're little they're going to be excited so having rooms where it's done here and it's kind of out of the main traffic area, and everybody knows when doors are shut, doors stay shut. It, it sounds obvious, but it can make a huge difference. And I know a lot of entrepreneurs try and do work on a laptop on the couch or on the kitchen table with people running around. I don't know how they do it. It's not. It's not efficient. It's not efficient. No, it, it doesn't work. Your second lesson of 2018. Yeah. So going back to, you know, the commitment we made in in 2018 of doing the poultry, we were committed to, you know, to, to doing it, uh, even when our outside help didn't pan out. Um, the lesson I learned is that when your family, and I do mean all my family, I mean my wife and both of my kids, when your family pitches into salvage and enterprise during a crisis, which is what this was setting a reward based goal is wonderful inspiration. Okay. So stuff hits the fan. I'm going to need you guys, but in exchange for your help, if we all work hard, we all pitch in, we dig ourselves out of this hole. This is what we're going to get. This, this is what we're going to get. And, uh, the kids, you know, they like, they still, they still got paid. You know, we're very intentional. We pay the kids, we track their time. Um, But on top of that, because we were asking more of them than they had originally committed to do, like we, we all needed this. This was the, you know, the, uh, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, right? And you you see a rainbow, uh, when there's storm clouds and when there's sunshine, right? Um, so we, we planned this intentional trip. Um, and the, the thing that it, it taught me, you know, the, the 2019, slash going forward um change is going to be we'll intentionally plan an annual trip and save for that trip all year long and kind of view it as like a farm benefit like this is a a paid benefit from the business you know um i i think we'll probably sit down in early 2019 and say okay this is the farm plan this year this is what we're all going to commit to but Here's the reward at the end of the year. Um, you know, and for us this year, it's we're we're going to Florida for um, 
uh, about a week and a half, and we've got a, a great uh, house rented. We're going to do some theme parks. We've got a budget for eating out. We've got a budget for entertainment. We've got a, a budget for groceries, um, and we've we've intentionally funded that. You know, um, as, again, as a paid benefit from the farm. That's not to say that that's a farm write-off. It's not, but Instead of pay, paying ourselves in other ways, we're we're saying we're we're taking this, we're we're buying the family a vacation as a reward. I really like the idea. I think it's it's great. If you think about working as an employee, I mean a lot of employees get year end bonuses or they have a party occasionally, those types of things. And if you think about your life as an entrepreneur, do you do that? I mean I I do it in some ways. You know, if I have like a busy week, like I'll say, hey, let's go out to eat. It's kind of a way to celebrate. But I remember being an employee for a company and maybe I felt entitled, but it was always like at the end of the year, I felt like, okay, there there should be something like a Christmas bonus coming down the way or even just hearing, hey, thanks for the help. Like, or let's celebrate. You know, we, we passed this goal. We got this big project done. Those things on the corporate side were nice. When you work for yourself and you're in charge, you know, you kind of, you got to be your own HR department. And I'm not sure all entrepreneurs are. I, I think most entrepreneurs do a terrible job at that. And I, I think I've done a terrible job at it. Um, and it took a crisis this year to open my eyes to that. You know, farming's hard and there needs to be a reward. I always had a reward um, in engineering. Um, the, the companies I worked for, like there was always – some kind of, of bonus at the end of the year. And when, when we had a bad year, it wasn't a very big bonus. It might've been like a couple of hundred bucks, but you had a job and you're in a minor recession. So you were just thankful to get anything, honestly. Uh, but then there were years that I, I got bonuses and it was like, you know, 3000, 3,500 uh, at, at the end of the year. And it was all based on profitability and, you know, Sounds corny, but pulling together as a team. And you look forward to those. You were excited when you got them. Yeah, absolutely. Just playing off your idea. I and mean, what are your thoughts on forced vacation time as an entrepreneur? Like, I'm going to give myself this year, I'm making this up, 2019, I'm assigning myself three weeks mandatory vacation time. I have to take it and cash it in by the end of 2019. I think it's a great idea. And I think... I'd be shocked if 5% of entrepreneurs actually did that. I'd be shocked if I ca if I said it and cashed in myself. Yeah. Yeah, but I like the I like the idea of it. The other thing I'm thinking is kind of like Kickstarter. If you have your reward, like you sit down in early 2019, here's the farm plan, here's what we want to do. Do you set stretch goals like Kickstarter has? If we do 10 farmers markets that are over $2,000, you know, we throw an extra $500 in the entertainment budget or little stretch things that might incentivize everybody to move forward and other things beyond just the big goal. Because sometimes a big goal that's far off that you're working towards, it loses some specialness till it gets really close. So if you put these shorter, easier to attain mile markers in along the way that require some work and stretching to get there, maybe that's another way to maximize that trip bonus. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. We we didn't come up with this in July. Um we we had our internal uh you know come to Jesus farm meeting with all parties involved in July and it was at that point um that I said, you know what? We're we're going to do this um July was a quote unquote off month with, with poultry. Um, but because of commitments with grass fed life, I think I worked harder in July than I did most other months out of the year. And it was just a realization that we need this, you know? So I think stretch goals would be a, a good way to incentivize that further. If you're, if there, if that's 12 months out in the future for us, it was about five months out. So it was, a lot easier um, to keep, you know, keep that 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 carrot, I guess, uh, 
clo- closer to us in reality, so to speak. I think regardless of what you do, um, you've got to you've got to intentionally take time off and spend it with your family. So just hearing your first two so far, you know, saying no, building in this reward. It's really the self care side of being an entrepreneur. Or was that just not there before where it was, hey, we got to do this. We we have to. Um, maybe there was some just automaton I'm doing to do. And now you've had this kind of waking up of, I got to look up and say, hey, is this working for life? We got to take some breaks. Yeah, no, that's that's totally what it was. That's totally what it was. And, and I had started to hedge that way and tried to, again, I'll go back to, to bringing in help from the outside to be on farm. Like that was my my first attempt to to make that happen, to give us a break, to keep the poultry enterprise going at full steam long term, to pay it forward to an aspiring young farmer. Like I was literally that that was very intentional, very well thought out um, to try and kill multiple birds with one stone. Right. To 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 function stack. And do lots of good things with with one move, and it just it just didn't pan out. And I'm not I'm not angry about it. Um, it just it just didn't pan out. So um, I had to take a more active role in self care. And actually, looking at my list of five, I mean, four of the five are are more self care. It's important. It's a long road coming, and I mean that ties into the second point that I have is. It always takes longer than you expect. And I think this is applicable to everything in life. I think most people, including myself, are very poor estimators of how long we think it's going to take us to do something. I've seen it recently when I had a contractor doing some work on my house. He'd say, oh, we'll be done by Tuesday. And I'm kind of looking at what he has thinking, no chance in hell are you done by Tuesday. And he wasn't. And I think about about a year ago, I remember telling you, oh, maybe I'll have my modules for the course recorded by the time you come out in January. And it was about this time of year, early November. And they didn't. I finished in June. And all everything just takes a long time, especially if you've never done it. And you typically, I think, when you take on a task, you you kind of highlight the main things that you think are involved in the task, but you leave out a lot of the little stuff. And the little stuff all adds up. So the advice I try and apply now when I take on new stuff is, you know, take your plans, cut them in half, and double your time frame estimate for how long you think it's going to take to actually get done because it'll probably take that long. I mean, when you look at some of the stuff you do on the farm that isn't a contractor related, it's stuff you got to do. You know, you put a new fence yourself, you know, you want to improve something do you find this rule to typically be true it always takes longer than you expect yeah i i do um and now that being said with you know more experience i've i've become a lot better at estimating um and being realistic with with time like you know uh, blocking out time you know it Five years ago, I was okay. Well, I can get this done and this done, and like that's going to take an hour. This is going to take thirty minutes. That's going to take two hours. And now I look at that like, no, that first task is going to take an hour. That's 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 two hours. And then forty-five minutes. No, that's that's probably an hour and a half. You know, like I just have more realistic expectations with what I can accomplish a day. Um, But it's still things take longer than you anticipate and i think there's a there's a disproportionate truth to that on the front end when you're you're getting a business built i mean if you look at everything we're doing with the course we're still doing subtle tweaks now going into the end of 2018 we started this right after new year's in 2018 i mean would you have thought that we'd still be doing all this stuff 11, 12 months out? No, no, I didn't. Um, I really thought we'd be completely and utterly finished by May 1st. 
I think that was my goal. And then we got into it a little bit. And I'm like, eh, that's not going to happen. It's, it's probably July 1st. And I think by and large, July 1st, we were 90% done. We had stuff we wanted to tweak. We've still got some things we're adding. We're constantly coming up with, eh, we should probably put this in there. That would be helpful. So creating additional tasks, um, it definitely took longer than I thought. I think from my very first thoughts of what it would take, it was at least double. Like initially I thought, eh, we'll, we'll be done by the end of March. And pretty quickly, a couple weeks in, probably even before I left California, I think I was, I realized like, yeah, that's not realistic. Um, and definitely as we got into March, I realized it wasn't realistic because I, I came home from California. I mean, I, I can't remember what day I got. It was a January 3rd. Then I was there for about 11 days filming. And I was actually thinking about this earlier this week. We, we got chicks here April 15th. And I was literally working 40 to 50 hours a week uh, on grass-fed life stuff from the middle of January till the middle of April. So call it three months. Like, I couldn't believe how much time I was investing. I knew there was going to be a lot of time. I figured it'd be 15 to 20 hours a week. It was 40. I mean, Brandy was doing a farmer's market almost every Saturday. So I could have six full days to focus on, yes, farm stuff, but if that was more planning and marketing and predominantly grass-fed life stuff. Um, and I think that's, like, I should have known that. Having already built a successful business with the farm, like, I should have known my estimates were going to be way off. I think a lot of the, the time in there was little things that maybe we fully didn't account for at the beginning. It's like, well... Not just does the video have to be edited, but it has to be reviewed. And then the changes have to be factored in. And I look at the stuff I was doing, and it was, well, I'm editing the video, and I have to record presentations. And you can look at both those and say, well, editing the video is going to take this long. Recording a presentation is going to do this long. But they don't stack. You can't do both at the same time because nobody wants to sit in front of a computer for 16 hours a day for 20 straight days. So... It was like it got stretched because like that's all I could mentally do to handle things. And I think a lot of businesses can be like this. You can add up individual tasks and say they're going to take this long. But can you truly do all those things at the same time? And can you do them all back to back, assuming there's no problems and no unforeseens? And you're actually factoring it all in. Because at the end, like you don't want to burn out and do a crappy job. And then... Like, so I, in the middle, like in parts, like, I'm like, I just got to take a week where I cannot look at this anymore. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I, I, you know, um, that's true. I was talking with a buddy of mine yesterday and, uh, he's, he's going to help me with a project here at the house. Um, and, um, we were talking about how long it was going to take and, I said, well, I figured, you know, it's a two day job. I said, it's probably not two full days. It's probably two, three quarter days. And by that, I mean, we're actually, you know, working for, you know, six, six and a half hours, like being productive. And this is, this is a little construction thing. And he was like, yeah, he's like, honestly, he's like a full day for me is like six hours. He's like, by the time I, you know, unpack tools, set up tools and start working, and then I realize, okay, I'm tired. I got to quit or I'm going to do a crappy job. When I get to the point of, I don't care if that beveled edge looks perfect. It's time to stop. He's like, that's after about six, six and a half hours of working. Then I got to pack up, you know, so like out of a 10 hour day, he's actually, you know, got six billable hours, call it. And I, I think there's, there's a lot of similarities there with, anything you do. Um, I know that's true with, with me on the farm. Like some days, you know, uh, I'll be like, man, I really need to do this. But like, I'm just, I'm shot. I'm going to do a poor job. Um, you know, and so, some days I've got the energy and I push through, um, this past Saturday I woke up, uh, started going full speed at 4am, got done at 9pm and had a task. I told you I, I would, 
accomplished for grass-fed life that didn't end up happening until the following day because I was worn out, you know, uh, it was a 17-hour day, effectively, and uh, that was enough. <laughs> I just, you gotta, you know, you gotta stop, you gotta stop. Yeah, so I think about this in the farm context. If you're starting a new enterprise, adding a new enterprise, starting a farm, what is everything that goes into that? And are you giving yourself a truly realistic time frame to execute that? I often hear a lot of veg farmers who talk about starting a new veg operation, you know, say March 1st, and they want to be doing a first farmer's market by June 1st. They don't have any of them. They're looking at a grass field. I'm like, you got to build beds, build the wash pack, you know, get your cold storage in. You want to build a tunnel put all these beds, do all this stuff in that amount of time, like you're crazy and try and do a good job producing the crops and market and have some idea of where your accounting is in the whole process of that. I mean, it's not that things can't be done quickly and fast. It's, is that the right way to do it? Are you somehow going to pay on the backside because you cut corners or rushed up front and maybe that backside is just you you mentally burn out or you you spend so much time working that you mentally burn out the other people in your life kind of going back to some of your earlier points yeah exactly and i I think to your point about a veg operation like i I would say that's all totally possible if what you're selling on june June 1st are some sprouts that you grew with grow lights on a rack in your basement (laughs) you know like if that's what you want to take and sell then that's that's possible um but you just don't realize you you don't know what you don't know you don't realize that the first time you go to put together an email sign-up sheet to sit on your table at the farmer's market, you're going to spend a couple hours putting that silly thing together. And there are a hundred other tasks just like that. that. Once it's done, it's in the background. It's done forever. Um, you, you never have to, to circle back to it, right? It's a one-time task. You know, it's a lot of work on the front end, but now it's done forever. Unless I want to make a small tweak to it, which that's easy, right? Um, but you just you just don't know what you you don't know. Here's another example. We started selling Jang cedars at Paper Pot. The cedars take a seed roller to dispense the seed, and I wanted to list those on the website. And I've I've done e-commerce sites for years with the conference and everything. I'm very familiar with WooCommerce. I've always used that. You think, well, add a product. It's going to take a few minutes. It took about two and a half hours because it's not just click add a new product. I mean, you got to figure out what am I typing? What do I need to convey? You got to have the images there. And this listing required having like multiple choices in a drop down. So there's, you know, five different rollers. You want to pick which roller you want. Not every product I have does that, so I had to figure it all out and you know read a bunch of stuff, watch videos to get it right. Then you test it and make sure it works. And like you said, it it, you you think it takes a little bit, it takes a lot, but then once it's done, it's done. It's in the background. But if I was planning on doing many other things that day, besides that, I'd be stressed because I'm like I'm never going to get this all done. So just give yourself more time than you think. Be less aggressive on your plans. I think everybody can get it all done, but not today. So thinking of that, your number three. Yeah, my number three lesson, and this really came about, uh, well, one, uh, because I was just, I was overburdened, uh, trying to give me a physical rest. Um, Brandy and the boys are gone to a co-op one day a week for homeschool. And I mean, they they leave here about 730 in the morning. They don't get home till after three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really difficult for me physically to go out and do all the work, uh, that I, I need to do physically by myself. And I realized like, you know, the house is empty. That's a great day for me to sit down and do things like we're doing right now. Record this podcast, uh, record grass fed life, YouTube videos, um, uh, focus on writing blog articles or emailing farm customers or doing invoicing. Like I've got quiet time in my house, but now I got to be out in the field. So what do I do? Hire some help. And the lesson learned was hiring help one day a week was not as hard financially as I had imagined it would be. You know, we added this again back in like August into July. 
At the same time, I decided we're going to start saving money for a vacation. And I'm fretting because I'm, I'm like, I'm adding stuff up. Like, okay, well, this is going to cost me X to hire this guy one day a week. Um, and it's going to cost me Y to save for a vacation and compound it over the number of weeks going towards the end of the season. Like, it's going to be hard to, you know, pay down all these balances we have on our lines of credit. You know, the, the kind of the way our, our business works is it's, it's go time for about eight months, nine months where you're producing all months worth of product. But that also means you're, you're, you've got these big, huge dips and peaks in your, your cash flow. And that also is, is true of, you know, lines of credit you use, uh, and you're paying for all kinds of butchering at one time, you know, we're butchering, um, almost $4,000 in butchering for beef that we'll be selling over the next six months. Right. So it's kind of hard to financially think that that's all going to be okay, but it wasn't as big of a deal as I thought it was going to be. Um, and it has allowed me to get into the house while it's empty one day a week. And yes, that is farm related. It's actually mostly grass fed life related at this point, just because of how busy I am with grass fed life. But it has brought balance uh, for me, um, gives me a physical break, lets me focus on things I'm focused on. And the, the 2019 change for us is we're going to continue to hire out labor one day per week, even, even though we're going to take a, a, a hiatus from poultry. We're still going to do this just to allow me to, to focus on the business side of the businesses that I own and be responsive to customers from both of those business businesses and the marketing needs of both of those businesses. When you think about hiring somebody, you said before, you know, you thought it'd be harder financially, but it wasn't harder financially or you, it worked out. Where do you think you erred? in that assumption. I mean, this is something I'm always curious about. Like there's a fear or there's a worry beforehand and it's usually based upon something and then you do it and it's not as bad as it you thought it was going to be. It was the consist knowing I was going to be consistently writing a check whereas in the past it's like, hey, we've got this you know, chicken day coming up and we need XYZ done, so uh let's let's call Al, see if he's available. Um yeah, we're gonna have to hire him for a day or a day and a half. But hey, we got customers coming and, and paying for chickens, so like we know we got some extra cash flow that doesn't sting. Versus, well, there's not necessarily any extra cash flow this week to offset that labor cost. And you know, our business really wasn't structured to have any kind of consistent, ongoing farm help. Um, so I think it was just looking looking back and thinking, well. I didn't plan for, you know, five or six hundred dollars a month in in labor that I'm paying somebody else for. And that was like it was just it, it was enough that, you know, it wasn't like a hundred bucks a month or a hundred and fifty, which is what it had been in the past. It's like, well, this, you know, this is you know, four, four times that amount. And like, I, I don't know, like I didn't, I didn't plan for it on the front end. So I was worried that I wouldn't have it on the back end. But to be honest with you, going, going back to everything we went through in July, it was kind of like to hell with it. I don't care. You know, um, you know, we're doing this because I'm going to implode if we don't. Like I can only work so many 12 to 16 hour days, six days a week. You know, I've got to spell myself some relief here. I think a lot of those to hell with it, I don't care type decisions people make. Like that's what pushes you over the edge to a right decision sometimes. Like you just need to get that extra nudge. I mean, if you would have zoomed out, financially and like you looked at the whole year knowing that it did turn out okay financially i'm thinking well if you would have like looked at the year laid out the 500 you could have seen right that hey this is possible 
versus focusing on the because what I'm hearing is week to week we don't have the extra cash flow, so week to week you're nervous, but week to week is only a small part of the whole where annually there isn't a shortage of cash flow. Right. Well, and I think if I would have looked at it back in February and said, okay, we're going to do this starting the first week of March, building up to when on-farm production really gets going the first week of April, and we're going to do this through November. So that's that's nine months. And if we say, okay, we're going to, worst case scenario, we're going to say it's 600 bucks a month, roughly, um, which maybe it's a little bit more than that. Maybe it's a little bit less than that. I won't know until we sit down, do our books at the end of the year. But let's just say it's $600 a month. That's 5,400 bucks, 55. Okay, I'm going to round up and say six grand. Okay, well, $6,000. Okay, I've got to go market um, X, Y, Z more bulk pigs and bulk cows to offset this. Like now I have a goal, just like saving for that vacation. Now I've got a goal. You know, I was planning on selling... 10 bulk pigs this spring, we're going to, we're going to crank that up to 12 instead of doing, you know, 12 in the fall, we're going to crank that to 15. I'm going to sell one extra whole cow. Now I know I've got that covered and I don't have to worry about it. And I think that's at least me, like that's how I would mentally approach that to feel warm and fuzzy inside versus getting to a point of critical mass and having to say, screw it. I'm going to explode if I don't do this. Or the other option was to say, sorry, grass fed life. You're on hiatus until after Thanksgiving. So I can just keep the plate spinning because I made these commitments. Um, like something had to give. And we should just decided there's more upside potential here. It'll work out. God will provide. It'll be fine. And it has been probably some of the best, $600 you spent each month as somebody who is a diehard, I'm not hiring somebody for the longest time. Yeah. Well, like I've never been opposed to hiring spot help uh, because I think it's, it's required, but this is definitely like, I'm okay hiring help, you know, once a week. And, and th now I'm thinking about 2019, like what, you know, what can we, like what improvements can we do or like what maintenance that, we, we haven't maintained tree limbs around the, the cattle fence for the last couple of years. There's brush that needs cleared, right? Um, getting some of that stuff knocked out to just maintain what we've built and spent so much money on, like it just makes sense. And it's just something that, you know, we'll be able to plan for going forward. But yeah, I would agree. That's some of the best money I've spent in a very long time. Um, I'd say since I invested in a set of pallet forks and the, um, the the feeding mechanism for the pigs, which yeah, those two things were about twelve, thirteen hundred bucks plus a full day to to drive to Southern Indiana, pick it up, and get it back home for the tractor. Going back to early two thousand seventeen, like that's that's the yeah, that's that's some of the best money I've spent in a long time. Yeah, and the idea of, you know, the maintenance costs, clearing out brush, I mean, this ties into the third thing that I have, and and that's, what are you really taking on whenever you start something and asking, trying to quantify that and saying, can you manage it all well? Because I think a lot of what we do take on, not just takes longer than we think, tied into my last point, but... It's also, we're taking on more than we think. If you think about raising cattle, I mean, every little nuance that goes into that, that you might not think about, well, you do have to check that fence. You do have to maintain the tree limbs on the fence. Occasionally, a tree limb is going to break and fall on the fence. You're going to have to do that fixing. If you think about homeschool, well, if you're signing up for homeschool, that means you're doing homeschool most days a week for a better part of the year. That means you got to get the printouts, you have to have supplies, you have to have a, a room. Are you aware of that? Starting a business. It's not just the act of production and everybody in this space falls in love with the production side of things, but you have to 
formalize a business, organize it. You have to do front-end accounting. You have to do your annual accounting. You have to meet with CPAs. You have to market. You have to build a website. You have to take images to put on the website. You probably want to have some sort of social media presence. Like there's so much that goes into everything. And when we first think of doing something, I don't think we really think of everything that's involved. So if you're looking at starting a new enterprise or adding on sheep or rabbits or something, I'd say, what am I going to have to do to do this beyond the production? I now got to put a blurb on my website about this. You know, I'm going to have to inform my newsletter about it. I'm going to have to market it heavier probably because it's a new enterprise. I'm guilty of not thinking about this stuff. I love to take stuff on and it's the these unforeseen, the little things, the maintenance costs that I think really hurt new enterprises, new activities when you do them. And not that you can foresee everything, but I think you can at least get a more realistic picture if you do consider what you're taking on up front. Yeah, I think it helps you not overcommit, spread stuff out. Um, You know, some advice that that I heard years ago, and I still pass this on to new farmers, particularly new farmers who I've got a, I've got, you know, this full-time job over here. I went to school to be, and you, you name it, we've seen it people that have, you know, come through the in-person workshops. Um, and, and now the course of I'm a CPA, I'm in the military, I'm an engineer, I'm an outside sales, I'm a welder, like whatever, but I want to farm and I want to farm full time. I always tell people, um, like, well, first you've got to go through this, this enterprise selection assessment and try to figure out like, what's the best fit for you and your farm and your land base and your finances right now. And that may not be your most favorite animal and critter that you want to raise. My advice to people is always to, you know, like add one enterprise per year on the livestock side. That's, that's a very easy way to compartmentalize things. So, you know, don't think you're going to go out and add, you know, eggs, broilers and turkeys in one year. Or don't think you're going to go out and add pigs and broilers in one year. Like those are all different enterprises. Add one thing at a time. Figure out your systems. Figure out the logistics. Figure out the marketing. Figure out your pricing structure on that one enterprise. Go through it for a year. You'll have it 80% figured out. You're not going to be a master expert by the following year. But there's enough inertia there that it's a bit easier to, to, again, to keep that plate spinning without putting tons and tons more energy into it. Now you've you've freed up some bandwidth physically and mentally to start a second enterprise. Um, and I think on the on the veg side, it's kind of the same way. I think about uh, Kyle, who's a local guy here. He and his wife are, are down in the, the Bloomington area. He's been through the course. They started a veg operation this year. No, nothing animal. They went through the course for, for veg. And what I thought was so smart was like, okay, they set themselves up to live on his income. Uh, she's farming full time. He's assisting her. He, he helps her as much as he can. He does one market on Saturday. She does a market on Saturday. Um, but they only took on an eighth of an acre. They didn't go out and say, we're going to do an acre and a half or two acres this year, or even a half an acre. They took on a bite sized manageable piece. Now going into winter, they can sit back and say, Okay, well, this is what worked. This is what didn't work. This is what we know we want to add next year. We can we can bite off that next piece, you know, or I can add that next animal, or I can I can increase production to add this next farmers market. You know, it's this is a long drawn out process. It it took me really a good five years, I would say, to to build our business up to a point where it would sub- let my family subsist. You know, there are areas where you think people. They just don't think about them. Some newbie comes off the street, hasn't listened to the show, hasn't been through the course. They want to set up a pastured poultry enterprise on the hayfield across the street from you. 
what things aren't they going to be thinking about that they should be in terms of workload? Because they probably realize they got to build chicken tractors. They're going to have to move them every day. Is it the marketing side? Is it the business side? Is it, you know, you have to build like this longer term entity? I mean, that that's where I feel like people are missing. Yeah, no, it's it's um because as farmers, we, we get all excited about livestock breeds or Johnny's seed catalog or wh- whatever that see shiny thing is, right? Man, that's 25% of the equation. The, the nuts and bolts, like people are going to go out and, you know, they're going to, they're going to, you know, get Joel's book on pasture poultry, which they absolutely should. Um, and they might go to a conference, maybe, um, they'll figure out which, you know, they'll spend days, literally days, if not weeks, deciding which chicken tractor design they will use, what their feed formulation should be. Um, I think with poultry, they'll, they'll probably really short themselves on brooder, brooder management, brooder setup which screws up the chicken before you ever get it out to the pasture. And nobody really in this space talks enough about that. So on the production side, I'd say that's the one shortcoming. But then on like it's everything else that you mentioned, they just don't think about the marketing, the, the farmer's market, how to assess a farmer's market. You know, um, how many pages is the guide? That's that's in the course, Diego. I don't even know. I wrote it. I don't know on 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 selecting a farmer's market. It's pages and pages. Of this is how you go assess a farmer's market, and like that's going to take a lot of time. There's a there's another guide on selecting a butcher. You know, these are all the things that nobody thinks about. Um, finding insurance, forming an LLC, uh, accounting. You know, they show up the first year to a CPA with a shoebox stuffed full of paper, and it's it's a nightmare. You don't know if you're making money or not. Um, I, I think it's all it's all the basic business stuff, and that's on and marketing, and that I think that's three fourths of the business, and I think that's where people don't invest. And I, I guess I feel like that's where you and I are different because we try and shine a light on that. Yeah, if you're going to start a business, you need to think about everything. The production, the marketing, the sales, and the fulfillment side. Those are all pieces of the pie that need to be considered. And under each of those things, there's a lot to do and a lot to put together and acquire, especially if you haven't done it before. One thing to think about there, thinking about yours, number four. Yeah, so this is the uh, the one area I really deviated from the the self-help section, <laughs> if you will. Um, we really needed to ramp up beef sales this year to justify taking on another 16-acre lease, uh, putting up almost a mile of exterior fence. Um, it was a big investment. We, we had the cattle, uh, the stockers here last winter. We had to have a place to graze them. So, like I said, we really had to ramp up sales, Um, and we've always had a waiting list for beef, Um, but, like, that only got us so far. We pretty quickly figured out, like, okay, we're not going to sell enough, you know, half cows to to make things cash flow, particularly on the back end this fall, when we've got to make that first loan payment for the fence, right? Um, So, uh, one of the students... In our course, Chris, who's up in Minnesota, um, I in our private Facebook group last week, I, I told him, like, hey, you called it. You were right. I was wrong. I did not think, you know, selling bottom line pricing beef quarters would work. I didn't think people would want to do it. It's not the best value. They have to pay more. But honestly, I told Chris it, it was a stroke of genius. Uh, we ended up selling – uh, 13 beef quarters. And I've still got people asking for beef quarters. We sold them at a premium. It moved the additional uh, uh, cattle that we needed to sell. It has let everything cash flow. 
Um, and honestly, I, big debt of gratitude to, to Chris for challenging me on that. Uh, and he's, he's in his first year of farming and here he is saying, well, I think you're wrong. And he, you know, he was, he was right. Um, and the, the, the change for us, uh, in 2019 is like, it's going to be a major focus of, of how we're going to operate. And kind of the flip side of this that it gave us, and I, I've already had two or three customers tell me they're going to do this. Is it, it, those 13 new quarter beef customers, like, well, they're, they're potential half beef customers now. So I've got people that have bought in, they've tasted the product, they, they, they've got an idea of how things work. Like that gives me a very nice platform of people to upsell to, to half or maybe even a whole beef for, for 2019. Um, you know, these, these people from, from 2018 and, and probably the big thing we learned is, you know what, there are busy professionals out there that have the money. They want the product, but they don't want a half of a cow. That's daunting, I think, mentally for them. And it's daunting to have to make all the beef cut selections. What we did, we made this really easy. It's like, you know, it's this price. You get this much product. This is how it's going to be cut. This is how it's going to be packaged. You pick it up at the farm. Bing, bang, boom, you're done. And a lot of people responded to that because it was a quarter of a cow. They didn't have to think about it. They just had to write the check, and they liked it. It doesn't resonate with me on a personal level, but it darn sure resonates on a business level. Yeah, it's a really interesting model. It's something we'll have to dig into next year on one of the episodes and ties into this idea of you know sometimes you just got to try stuff, even if you don't think it's going to be as good as you might expect. I think it's a constant process when you're in business to come up with ideas of how to market stuff, how to verbally describe things, how to show images of things. And if you go in and start your business thinking, well, you can just copy a certain website and make it look like that and it's going to work, or go in selling with this model because that's what Darby does and that's going to work, I think you're in for a rude awakening. You're going to have to start with something that does work, but then try a whole bunch of stuff after. And if you look at this trial, I mean, you pitched it out there to people. What's the downside if nobody took it? You wasted a little bit of time, you know, writing up the email about it? Yeah, I spent, I don't know, probably, I'll say half of a day. It was probably four hours by the time it was all said and done because I had to dig into uh, go, go on, honestly, I had to look at my own spreadsheets that are in the course <laughs> to say, okay, out of, out of a 900 pound cow, this is what we get. We get this many rib steaks, this many T-bones because the way we, we sold these quarters was like, you get a proportional amount. I'm not going to give you 80% hamburger, right? You're going to get a proportional, fair, equitable amount of steaks, roasts, burger, stew meat, etc. So that, that took some time. And then I had to carry the cost of the processing, so I had to factor that in, um, type up the email, put it out there. Actually, I ended up doing a, a graphic uh, and did some uh, Facebook marketing for it. You know, I'll say I'll say it was a day, honestly. By the time <laughs> – go back to what you said earlier. Eh, this will take two hours. No, it was probably eight hours by the time it was all said and done. Um, that's 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 when I'm out if nobody if nobody took it. Um, but we sold, we sold effectively three and a half cows. Yeah, so eight, eight hours of work, I mean, that's the worst you lose. But yeah, I guess you l learn something in the process too. Like say nobody took up or one person took that up. Maybe then you look at, well, am I priced too high? Is the selection wrong? Am I sending it to the wrong people? Is what I'm sending to them written the wrong way? So there's a lot you can learn. And I think people just get afraid to try stuff. And this ties into my fourth lesson. And it's Everything you're afraid of doing really isn't as bad as you might think it is. There, I think we put up a lot of resistance when we want to try something new out of our comfort zone because we think, oh, it's not going to work or it's going to be a ton of effort. And I've found, maybe this is just a me thing, that when I do these things that I was nervous or not excited about taking on, they're never really that bad. Like when I had to move the course over the summer, we moved it from hosting the educational platform on the website 
over to Teachable, which is made to host course courses. Going up to that, I'm like, I don't want to do this. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be so much work. And then one day I just kind of started it. And I think I finished maybe the same day or the next day. It didn't take nearly as long as I thought. And it wasn't that bad. I just had to start. Like my whole fear was doing this thing. It wasn't once I got started, it, it, I just went through the steps. And recently, I changed around the Permaculture Voices website. I've been kind of dreading that for a long time. Dive right in and do it. It's not that bad. So I think if we th have these ideas or somebody suggests things that we realize we should do and we know inevitably we're going to have to do, but they're a little bit out of our comfort zone, you might as well just jump in and do it. Because it's probably not as bad as you thought. And if it's truly terrible, then it's probably not even on the radar to begin with. Right. And you think about you you hiring somebody. I mean, there's another example, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, you know, the 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 example was, was teachable. Um, I think that's kind of like my third point. Because you came to me and you're like, the, 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 you know, the Diego has to fix every little technical issue. It was a burden, right? And the fix was we move it to teachable. And if there's a problem, uh, case in point, somebody can't log in. Well, Diego doesn't have to fix it now. And, and the process was, you know, I get the customer service email. I have to read that. I have to respond to them. I have to forward it on to you. You have to fix it. You have to email them. Let them know it's fixed. They email you back. Yes, I can log in now. Whereas now, if they have a login problem, Teachable fixes it. You and I don't touch it. And the cost to do that was a thousand bucks. But it frees up all this time. So you spend, in this case, $1,000. You spend, call it a day to move it from platform A to platform B. Boom, it's done. It's in the background. We don't have to touch it anymore. It frees up time. It lets you be more efficient. It lets me be more efficient. And I think you can apply that to any number of things, hiring help, investing in the proper piece of equipment, whether that's a kit for a paper pot or a set of pallet forks for a tractor or whatever it is, like if it makes you more efficient, it makes life better. It makes life more enjoyable. It makes being an entrepreneur more enjoyable. And it's not a hundred thousand dollars. It's a thousand dollars. Like that's at this point for me, that's like no brain. And that's what I told you. Like that was a two minute conversation. I'm like, just do it. I, a thousand bucks to fix all this. Do it. Yeah, and that ties in, I mean, I'll jump ahead. It ties into the fifth thing I had, and it's just pay up. Get the best solution you can afford. And if we look at Teachable as an example, Teachable's in the business of providing a platform to host online courses. That's what they do. They have a whole staff that just does that. Their whole business is making courses. When I was trying to manage that on a platform that it was made for hosting courses, but it was made by a company that wasn't as big as Teachable, so inevitably it had flaws. This is like buying the smaller janky version versus, you know, a Cadillac. And one works, one works, but it's smaller for a reason. There's problems. And it took all this stuff that we were doing, the time, and we were able to outsource that for a fixed cost that was low so we could focus on what we do best, which is make this type of content, work on the course, work with people, help people along. If I'm spending time troubleshooting why something isn't playing on the website, that's a part of this business, but it's not where my time is best spent. That's not how I can add the most value to the business. And it's also frustrating. It's stressful. It's disheartening. And if you look at this from an equipment standpoint, if you buy crappy equipment or you're trying to DIY something and you're just fighting it and it's not working as well as it should, maybe production turns out okay, but what's the 
physical cost? What's the emotional cost on it? If you hate moving the chicken tractors all day because you made them and you made them wrong and they're crap, well, what good is it that you saved some money by not paying a carpenter or buying a design to make the right ones? Like you, you're going to pay down the line. So one thing that's came up a lot on podcasts, I didn't, I don't credit this to me, but it's get the best solution you can afford, the most professional solution you can afford. And I think you can apply that to anything. Yeah, absolutely. And like, look, uh, you know, when you're first starting out, if you got a shoestring budget, if you're not sure, fine, DIY it. But when, when you get serious about making money with a business, you should invest in the proper equipment, like you said, that you can afford to make that business more efficient because then that frees you up mentally, physically, emotionally to take on the next thing. And there's always going to be a next thing. There's always a fire to put out. There's something that needs to be dealt with. And, uh, you know, I, I think back to like putting in our, our in-ground piping system here and, and putting in the, uh, you know, the, the, the frost-free, what they call a frost-free drinker or freeze-proof drinker for the cows, you know, going back to 2012, you know, we had to go out and water the cows with a, a garden hose attached to the house, ran two or 300 feet out to the pasture, and we had to do that three times a day to keep the cows hydrated. And we had to drain down that hose every time we did that. I mean, watering cows was literally a three plus hour per day task. Sure. You were not looking forward to doing that each day. No, it sucked. I mean, it absolutely sucked putting in these, these frost free drinkers. We put in two of them, one in the back area, one in the front area. They're a half mile apart. So no, other, no matter where the cows are, we, they've got access to water. Now, it, can, there get, can you get some ice in there? Do you sometimes have to clear it out? Yes. If it's extremely cold for more than a couple of days, you got to go out there and bust these out of where they drink. But by and large, these are 99% hands-off. They work. The cows are hydrated. And you look at all the time that saves. And the animals uh, are in, in better condition. Right. Um, and the cows prefer to drink out of those in the summer, too, because the water's colder. Um, they were expensive to get installed. They're, gosh, probably twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 each. But guess what? I'm not going out three hours a day, seven days a week in the winter, which is supposed to be my downtime physically to, to water cows, you know, uh, and you really you never kept up with them. You know, they're always too thirsty. So. Yeah, it is what it is. You 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 buy what you need to um, within reason. Don't be stupid um, to to make life easier. I hope I'm not just conveying this is a money thing, but I think it's also a location thing. It's a layout thing. It's a process thing, and maybe you have to pay up in the form of just spending some time analyzing your own situation, or visiting another farm, or doing some consulting. But if a task is really hard. I would always be asking, is there a way to make this easier? Could I move this closer? Could I automate it? Could I buy a piece of equipment to make this better? Could somebody just show me a better way? Or, or is is this thing redundant itself? Because when you got to do these three and a half hour busting waters, like $1,200 a pop, like that sounds like a bargain. Yeah, it, no, it is a bargain. It is an absolute bargain. It is a lot of work. Uh, I mean, it's $1,200 in like days each to install these things. Um but yeah, it, it could be in, like okay, you, you got to do bookkeeping. You don't 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 know how to do bookkeeping. Like, go take a class, or take an online class, or or hire a bookkeeper. Like, do one of those three, so that bookkeeping isn't this huge burden that you put off until, you know. March 29th because you, your taxes are doing two and a half weeks and then you're trying to rush through it and you do a crappy job and you might make mistakes and that can cost you in many ways. 
I mean, bookkeeping is a good example because that's, I mean, one thing I can just hear people saying like, oh, I don't want to set up QuickBooks. It's terrible. Like, I, I just know it's going to be like setting up QuickBooks. I thought the same thing. It's easy. It's not that hard. And once it's done, it's done. And then it's like super simple to do your bookkeeping. And maybe it's $20 a month. Not that big of a deal. There, there's so many examples of this. So that if you're if you're too DIY in your process, in your equipment, in what you're doing, you're likely saving somewhere, but you're also paying for that somewhere else. And really think about is that trade off worth it? It's it's not enough just to save you know a few hundred bucks on the front end. Don't forget the back end cost, physical, mental, and financial cost to not doing something well. And thinking of that, to wrap it up, your number five lesson of 2018. Yeah, so th- this is this is a, a big one for us, and this is uh, again, this is this is this is 2019, and that's that's all we're committing to at this point. But redefining your farm business as a quote unquote part time income, uh, while mentally difficult, is okay. And that's a change we're making in 2019. We need a physical break. Uh, and while financially, if you were to zoom out, you you could look at like where we're at, where we're going to be at, particularly because of the cattle enterprise and the windfall that we're going to see financially. You could zoom out and say, well, can't you live on the, the farm income? that you're going to get in 2019? And the short answer is yes, I can. But that windfall of income for us, because of, of how we are set up, we fill all those bulk orders in October. The windfall of income won't come until the fourth quarter. So I'm at the point where I'm saying, you know, the farm is not going to be our our sole source of income for our family to live on in 2019. Um, What it's going to become is a highly, highly profitable, and again, air quotes, part-time income. Um, But we're going to be transitioning ourselves to to more multiple income streams as, as a family, you know. Uh, as my wife is kind of doing her own thing, um, we're going to roll the farm back a little bit. That's going to free me up to do some stuff. I don't know exactly what that is yet. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there uh, for me uh, in, in very different, very different spaces, um, wildly different spaces. Um uh, so, uh, you know, I've got some, some decisions to make. Um, it, but, you know, like while this is going to require some off farm income from most likely a, a non farming space, the flip side is it's like, it's going to allow us to rest and heal, not just physically, which is the, that is the driving force behind all this. Like my back just can't take another, you know, full season of production. It just can't. And that's that's a hard thing to admit. It's not something I like to admit. Um but it, it's it's reality. You know, I've had multiple bulges and a herniation, have degenerative arthritis. I'm doing pretty well now. Uh, headed into the end of the season, um, kind of had to duct tape myself together to to get through this year. Um, but you know, kind of kind of going back to point number one, you got to be able to know you know when it's time to say no to something that's both successful and profitable. Like oh, I want to be able to walk straight <laughs> when I'm an old guy, right? Uh, I want to be able to enjoy grandkids. I don't want to be debilitated. So I'm going to give myself a year to heal physically. It's going to allow all of us to heal mentally and spiritually. And, you know, we we talk again a lot about holistic context. And the, this is me living this out. This isn't phony. This isn't fake. This is being genuine and real. Like this is where I'm at. And this is us saying, 
this is what the next 12 months are going to look like. We'll get to this point next year. We'll go through the same process again and evaluate. Uh, that's that's a big takeaway uh, for us. You know, it's not not a point on my list, but being very intentional once a year and saying, like, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to commit to. Other opportunities that come along, they might be sparkly and shiny, but we're going to push those off, right? Like that, that'll, they'll get cast into the, the reassessment pool and time frame at, at the end of this, you know, whatever year we're in. Um, so yeah, that's, that's a big change for us, but it's, it's a, it's a decision we've made and that's the direction we're headed. I think it's a great one. And it really highlights the point for you and for anybody listening to this, for myself, you do this for you. This is your life. Entrepreneurship gives you a lot of opportunities. It's up to you to decide how those opportunities fit in with the rest of your life. And it can be hard to compare yourself against the knowns out there. So somebody listening could say, oh, Darby does this, but I only do this. I need to be more like Darby. Or Darby could say, I need to be more like Joel. Or you see people on social media and Instagram and they're doing so many great things and you look at what you're doing and for some reason, like you don't feel like you're stacking up against them. You have less chicken tractors or, you know, you're not brooding on farm or whatever it is. And I think this whole episode really ties in this idea of this is your life, your decision. Everything has to fit together for you. And for everybody in your life, there's not a right, there's not a wrong. Don't be afraid to flex. Don't be afraid to change. Don't be afraid to say no. And why you start doing something might not be why you finish doing something. You might have wanted to start farming because you thought it was just exciting and fun, but you might change it along the way because it has to pay certain bills, or you might scale it along, scale it back along the way because maybe it's just not fun anymore. And I think all those things are okay because you have to do what's right for you. So don't hold yourself against somebody else and compare and feel like you're not a farmer or you're not an entrepreneur because you're not doing dot, dot, dot. If it works for you, own it and do the best at it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's something, um, you know, I've, I've told people for a long time, like, it's completely okay to be a part-time farmer. There's nothing wrong with that. And I, I've heard other people in this space, big names, put people down for holding an off-farm job and farming part-time. And it disgusted me because that's that's just not right. Um, you do what you can do, what works for you, what works for your family, make it the best you can and, and be happy with it. And don't like, don't ever compare yourself to somebody else. Right. Um, you know, if, if, if everybody compares themselves to Joel Salatin or, Elliot Coleman, well, not too many of us are going to stack up very well, right? Um, but you know those people are rare. They're an inspiration, uh, but but they're they're rare. And to to compare yourself to them is very unrealistic, and you'll never feel like a success. And I'm here to tell you. Regardless of how big your operation is, if you are running it profitably and you enjoy it and it's enhancing your life and the life of your family, that's a success. And anybody else that that tells you otherwise is dead wrong. Let them think what they want, but they're dead wrong. And I hope this episode has really conveyed that. You might not be able to do what I do or what Darby can do, or maybe you can do more than we can. But I think a lot of the points that we highlight here 
are universals. Say no. Do what works for you. Take on stuff. Try stuff. If you enjoyed this conversation and you want to learn more, Darby and I have an opportunity for you to learn more. Darby and I are hosting a two-day mastermind event here in Southern California, co-hosted with Primal Pastures out of Murrieta, California. It's going to be one day of in-the-field curriculum with Paul Grieve of Primal Pastures, talking about everything that they do to scale their farm business and how they got there. And it's truly a business. That's a farm business that hires or that employs multiple people. It is not a you-specific business. It's very different than Darby's farm business, which is, which is smaller, more niche. Primal Pastures is, is kind of the next phase or evolution of growth if Darby had kept pushing it, if that's what he had wanted to do. So Paul's going to be walking through a bunch of stuff of how they got there, how they do it, how they market it. And then the other day will be a mastermind event with Darby and myself. And that day is going to entail a small group of people where you get a set amount of time to ask your questions in front of the group. We help answer them. We'll crowdsource some suggestions from the group, but really help you work through issues like this that, frankly, you can't find in our course, you can't find in a book, and they require outside eyes, outside opinions to help talk through them and hopefully not just get you an answer, but get you an answer that you can work with and build off of that meshes with all other parts of your life. Yeah, this is something I'm excited about. Um, I, I love teaching and I'm, as an engineer, I love problem solving. So having conversations with people about whatever it is, it could be production, it could be sales, it could be uh, family context. It, it could be, you know, where do I invest dollars next on my farm? How do I go from part-time to full-time? Whatever. Um, I love digging into that stuff. And um, one thing I, I want to add here is these are going to be very small groups of students. I mean, you're, you're talking um, a, a group of, of roughly, you know, 12-ish students each day. So very small, um, intentionally, so we can spend a lot of time with each student each day to answer your questions, to teach you as much as we possibly can. Um, and you don't just get the in-person, right, Diego? Yeah, correct. So everybody that comes to the workshop will also get the online course included in their ticket for the in-person workshop. Now, you may be thinking, well, if I get the online course, that's enough. I just want to learn from Darby, and that's great. Darby has one style of pastured poultry production that he uses. His businesses run one way. The benefit I see on the production or the business side is you're going to get a very different view of things from somebody who runs a similar business just at in a different way, in a different market, at a different scale. Given what you know about Paul, how do you see his business versus yours? And what do you see as a benefit to somebody who will be in attendance of getting both those views, yours through the online course, Paul's in person? I think there are a ton of benefits. Um, I think if you're like, if you've just started farming, you're ready to start farming, or you're a couple of years into it, then you're going to learn more from me. Um, I think if you're at the scale that I'm at, and you're like, I, I want to take this to the next level, then Paul's the guy. And he doesn't just do poultry. I mean, he's got some very unique things that he does with his business in terms of marketing products from other farms that he partners with. And the way he goes about marketing those products, his, his online marketing, his direct-to-consumer retail side, uh, he's got a fantastic wholesale model. Um, you know, if you're interested in getting bigger, having employees basically being the CEO of your farm, there is a ton to learn from Paul. And I'm not going to lie. Like I am personally looking forward to learning from Paul 
because again, what our plan right now is that like this is this is a twelve month plan. I may come home from that and be like, you know what? In twenty twenty, like this is the direction we're going to go. I, I don't know. Paul may inspire me. Well, and some of the things that they do on their farm may solve some of the problems that farms like yours have, the physicality problem, the day-to-day problem. You know, he's aggregating from other farms. I know in the past you haven't wanted to do that, but maybe you go there, you see what he's doing, and you look the aggregation route. It's less physical. It's shelf-stable. It's something that you could hire out probably easier. So there's potentially something there. Yeah, and so like one of one of the ideas floating around the back of my head is – like, do we want to do an on-farm store? And that's nothing I'm going to do this year. It's probably nothing I'm going to do next year. But it is something we've kicked around um, where we've got a space to direct sell our products on-farm. There are a lot of other local products. I mean, anything from smoked sea salt to local mustard, ketchup, barbecue sauces, uh, goat cheeses, raw honey, you name it. I know so many people. It'd be very easy for me to have an on-farm store selling those things. On the flip side, I'm also kind of thinking about things like there's a real shortage of farm supply in in my area. Uh, you know, things like uh, fiberglass hay feeders and grazing supplies. Uh, there's not a local rep uh, for one of the seed companies I use. So there, there's kind of a, a two-pronged attack there, and that's those are kind of some of the things I'm interested in learning from Paul, particularly on the business side. Paul's a CPA, uh, for those that don't know. So you talk about a guy that comes at business from a business acumen. I mean, he is the guy. Um, and he's got a lot to offer, particularly if you want to scale up, because there are things I have not had to think about, like payroll and things of that nature. So a ton that anyone can learn from Paul. I mean, look, look I, I, there's a ton I can learn from Paul. Um, so regardless of where you are, I mean, this is, there, there's a lot to get out of this. And I mean, we've, we've tried to make this a, a really solid value. And I think we have, you get our full online course, you get the two-day in-person small class mastermind course, and then the first pe- ten people who sign up, uh, you're also going to get uh, the the on-farm pasture poultry processing course as an additional bonus that we have with Ben Grimes. I think there's a ton of value in it. It's a very unique workshop in the sense of this is small group, thirty people. We're dividing those 30 people into two groups of 15, 15 people with Paul one day, the other 15 are with Darby and I, the next day they switch. There's not many workshops out there in the farm space that limit things to that small. And it's something we're trying because we really want people there to get as much out of it as possible. It's the only one that we'll be doing with Paul this year, and it might be the only one we ever do with Paul. So if you're at all interested in attending, get tickets while you can. It is limited availability in all sense of the word. For more information on that, visit grassfedlife.co. There you have it, lessons from myself and Darby. Hopefully you can use some of these lessons to make your 2019 better. And hopefully you can do this process with yourself and think about things you learned in 2018 so you can make your 2019 better. If you want to learn more about the in-person workshop that Darby and I talked about at the end of this episode, you can learn more at grassfedlife.co, which I've also linked to in the show notes for this episode. That's all for this one. Thanks for listening. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.